Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and I'm going to start off tonight. Um, I'm going to kind of switch things around a little bit. Um, each Sunday night, we have a theme, kind of a topic. Um, except we're kind of in the middle of a bunch of topics and I kind of want to kind of clear the air about that. So I'm going to kind of take a step back. I want to, I want to reorient ourselves, uh, before we kind of go any further. So first thing I want to start with is I'm, we're going to dive right into a sutra tonight. We're going to dive right back into the sutra that we've been looking at. So in case you are new, um, each Sunday night we talk about a different idea, but we have also been going through a Buddhist sutra for weeks and weeks and weeks now. And this sutra, as everybody knows who has been coming, there's sort of two, maybe three different translations of this sutra in English. Perfect. So um, cool. Yeah. So Brendan just put into the chat, which is a link to my translation of the sutra. There is also a translation from Tibetan, which I probably will read a little bit from tonight. And you can find that at a website called 84,000.read. We often have the link to that. It might show up eventually. <laughs> um, and then finally, the third translation of this is in this book called, cool. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Brandon. So this is the book, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras that I'm always reading from, except the portion of the sutra that we're reading tonight is not in this book, unfortunately. They didn't translate it. So all we have is, is a translation from Tibetan and the translation I've been working on from the Chinese version. We'll, we'll see how these uh, match up tonight. So the section of the sutra that we are in is a beautiful section. So far, it's my favorite part of the sutra. And it's a section that is called the Dharma door on the single characteristic the Eka Lakshana Dharma Paraya, the single characteristic Dharma door. And it's a beautiful part of the sutra where the, the whole sutra, which is very long, you know, we've, <clears throat> we've been going through it pretty, you know, line by line, but it's taken us a long time to get here. There's, a, there's an idea, and it's this idea, the single characteristic. And it's an idea that started popping up in the sutra, oh, many, 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 many pages ago. And it sort of just started to pop up as a theme, sort of a philosophical theme of the sutra. And then that idea has now come to kind of the, the forefront of the sutra. And the star of the sutra, the primary bodhisattva of the sutra, and it's named after this bodhisattva, the bodhisattva Manjushri. Manjushri bodhisattva asks a bunch of other bodhisattvas, how do you explain this single characteristic Dharma door? Now, we've been talking about this for a while. So I've given many explanations already about the single characteristic. And we have read many bodhisattvas so far who have already explained their understanding of the single characteristic. So I'm not going to say anything more about what that is because we're going to find out. We're going to listen to some bodhisattvas describe this teaching. So in order to do that, I want to pick up right where we left off. And we're going to kind of ease into this. The first bodhisattva that we're going to be looking at it's it's kind of things are going to get a little wilder not not too long from now so where i'm starting if you're in the 
84,000.read website and you're looking at the Tibetan version, I'm at line 1.292. So in that link, so it's a very long document, but the, the paragraphs are numbered. So this is paragraph number 1.292. If you're on my translation, we're at what I call chapter five. I'm dividing this into chapters because it's such a long sutra. And we're pretty much at the end of chapter five. So you have to scroll all the way down. So we're going to start and we're going to dissect one of these poems, one of these uh, verses from the Bodhisattva. So in the... Tibetan version here, the Bodhisattva, who we're going to hear from first, is called Bodhisattva Dispeller of All the Darkness of Anguish. From the Chinese, the Chinese is not so much about dispelling as being free from being liberated from, having transcended the darkness of sorrow. So free of the darkness of sorrow, Bodhisattva. So anguish, sorrow, but a Bodhisattva who is free of the darkness of sorrow. So that's our Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva's teaching on the single characteristic is this. The Dharma teaching on the single characteristic severs the continuity of all anguish. It is without anguish or timidity. It teaches the Dharma that all beings feel the pain of anguish and that the root of anguish is self-clinging and possessiveness. Even so, it is grounded in the sameness of self-clinging and possessiveness. Okay, a little chunky for me. It's a little chunky, that translation there. So now let me give you mine from the Chinese and then we'll talk about it. So the way that I would translate this from the Chinese is that the Bodhisattva free of the darkness of sorrow said, how are the arrows of sorrow plucked out? As I and mine are the root of sorrow. If one is able to abide in the equanimity of I and mine, this is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. Okay, so we're gonna start by plucking out the arrows of sorrow and anguish. That's gonna be sort of our first uh, dive into the idea of the single characteristic. So, in either, you know, both translations from the Tibetan, from the Chinese, yeah, they're a little, you know, they're different here and there gr grammatically. The, the, like I said, the Tibetan translation is a little chunky for me. It doesn't flow as beautifully as I think it could. But the general ideas are the, are the same in that sense. What's the root? What's the cause of sorrow? and anguish, I and mine. And then what I like, so this is where it gets a little chunky, as I, as I keep saying. The, the Tibetan, it's, it says it, it says it, but it's like very kind of complicated the way it says it. So it says that all beings feel the pain of anguish, and the root of anguish is self-clinging and possessiveness. And we're gonna talk about that. Even so, 
It is grounded in the sameness of self-clinging and possessiveness. I don't really even know what to make of that grammatically. I guess the subject is the Dharma teaching on the single characteristic. So it is grounded in the sameness of self-clinging and possessiveness. So what's the root of anguish and sorrow? I and mine, or self and possessiveness. What's the single characteristic teaching? It's about the equanimity or the sameness of I and mine. So I was thinking that to start us off, like to get our, our, the Dharma wheel turning this evening, I wanted to talk about this idea, the I and mine. And there's a word for this, by the way, and it's not the theme for tonight. I haven't even told you about the theme yet. Um, I wanted to stay focused on this idea of the single characteristic for a while, but there's a word for what is being called I and mine. There's a, I mean, a Sanskrit, like a technical Buddhist word, a Sanskrit word for this. What's being called I and mine or self and possessiveness? It's a term called uh, mamakara, M-A-M-A-K-A-R-A, mamakara. Mamakara is a, a funny word. Um, mamakara is, um, in English, the best you could probably do is self-making. Mama, mama is oneself. And to kara or karika or krita, it's all the same word. And it means to kind of like make so self-making in a way. So that's the word or that's the idea, but it, it is particularly the matrix, if you will, about self and the objects that the self possesses. In other words, mine. So me and mine, me and mine making. That's what we're going to talk about for a little bit here. And I think I mentioned this last Sunday. I might have mentioned this last Sunday, might have even been some other Sunday, whenever it was. I was thinking I wanted to start tonight off talking about self-creating, self-making, but particularly as it pertains to the arrows of sorrow, the arrows of anguish. So the thing that I might have mentioned last week is a dream that I had. And I've been talking about this, a dream, this dream a lot because it has, it has become a great useful example um, to, to sort of teach from. So really quickly, the dream I had not too long ago was it was a dream like any other dream. So I thought it was a normal, a normal day in my life. And what the dream was is that I went into my kitchen and it was weird because it was like a big barn, but it was my kitchen. And I knew it was my kitchen because my refrigerator was in the kitchen, which is, you know, that's where, that's where refrigerators are in kitchens. And so even though it was a big barn, it was my kitchen and that was my fridge. And I opened up the fridge and there was a, a, a person in there. There was a guy in my fridge, like eating, eating my food. And I got very upset as you could imagine if you thought somebody was in your refrigerator. So I got upset. I kind of yelled at him to like, get out of here. What are you doing in my refrigerator? Get out of here. Uh, and I think I might have mentioned when I told this story that I went and got a bat. I didn't injure this dream person, but I did wave the bat at them, hoping to get them out of the refrigerator. 
And I don't really know what happened. You know, it was one of those dreams that I just kind of woke up. But I had that vivid memory of, uh, of all of that, meaning the matrix of me, my fridge, and this, let's call it anguish. Let's call it being upset. Let's call it anger or whatever. But so there was this matrix of those kind of three elements, the me, the mine, and then the emotionalness of it all, which was that I was upset. So there's a couple of things going on in there that we wanna really, at, like in terms of Dharma study, there's something in there to really pay attention to that I have been paying attention to as I've reflected on it. And it's sort of a, you know, it's complicated, but the first thing to kind of think about for me, the first thing I reflected on was, huh, you know, had it not been my refrigerator, had it just been a refrigerator, and I opened up a refrigerator, in a dream, and there was a person in there, I might have thought it was odd. I might have thought, huh, that's strange. There's a, there's a person in a refrigerator. I might have even been concerned and been like, oh, were you trapped in there? Do you need help getting out of there? So if it had just been a refrigerator, my emotions about the whole thing could have been different. So the first thing I kind of recognize as a Dharma practitioner is how the, the arising of the being upset was coming from the fact that they were in my refrigerator. So there was this sense of, you know, being encroached upon, a sense of intrusion, like all of these kind of aspects that where we would maybe get angry like that. So once again, the Dharma practitioner is thinking, oh, look at the arising of suffering. Look at the arising of the anguish from the attachment to it being my refrigerator and all of that. Again, whereas had it just been whatever refrigerator, I perhaps wouldn't have had such emotions. But there's something even deeper that's going on there that we want to pay attention to or that I'm interested in paying attention to. And what it is, is it is how the dreamer, which in this case is me, it's about how I, quote unquote, I am asleep and I'm having this dream where I'm in my kitchen with a refrigerator and there's somebody in my refrigerator. So I'm having this dream. And what I want to be aware of is that there's a strange sense of being me in that dream, by which I mean, you know, being, as I often talk about in Dharma doors, the idea of being the, the, a body in that world seeing seeing a refrigerator going and grabbing a bat waving a bat like so i have a body or at least i think i have a body in that dream and in fact again i went and grabbed a bat and held a bat i remember holding the bat now what we want to notice is from a kind of oh, I guess you would call it kind of an epistemological point of view, if you will. But we want to notice the, the co-arising of a sense of self with the sense of my, you fill in the blank, whatever it is. In this case, it was my kitchen, my refrigerator. But the, the dependent origination going on here is that as I am perceiving that barn as my kitchen, 
I am simultaneously fabricating a sense of being me whose kitchen it is in that sense. Now, what I'm really, really want to point out tonight is that in that dream, even though it was a barn and not my kitchen, like my, my kitchen, which is right over there, didn't look anything like that. It was, a, again, a big old crazy barn. But the me, the Michael, the me Michael in that dream, it was his kitchen. Like, I remember being in that dream thinking, this is my kitchen. That's my refrigerator. That person's in my space. But of course, when I woke up in the morning, that wasn't my kitchen. First of all, of course, it was a dream kitchen, so it didn't exist at all. But kind of more importantly than it not existing at all, I'm really interested in the Michael who in that dream thought it was his kitchen. Because that's not me. I think that I think that's my kitchen in that way. And so in terms of me and me making, I making, self making, self creating, the Dharma practitioner in me is very interested in that fabrication of a sense of self that was convinced that that was their kitchen. And that, from a Buddhist point of view, we would call that delusion, moha, confusion. I was confused because that wasn't my kitchen, but I thought it was my kitchen and there was somebody in my refrigerator and then I could get angry. So one level of Dharma is noticing that mental anguish and anger in these things come from senses of possessiveness. But tonight what we're looking at is how, where the very sense of self is coming from that can get angry about stuff. So R Renata has a question first, Renata. Well, I think though there is something really primal about say, your refrigerator that might be different from say I, your closet. I mean, even my dogs fight over their food, food bowl. I mean, that is sort of part of a, you know, our, I would say evolutionary brain as, as far as our refrigerator. It's like my dogs and they're fighting over bowls. So isn't that a little different than say other forms? I mean, well, it's funny that you should kind of bring up the idea of kind of like the evolutionary biology of all of this, because I did want to actually eventually kind of come around to that. So what, how I wanted to kind of work that in Renata was what we're kind of talking about is what could be called appropriation appropriation as a sort of like, well, as I often say, ownership, like owning something is kind of an extension of appropriation. Appropriation is making use of something, but there's a particular aspect to it. And what I mean is, is that, and I wanna give an example of the, more of the eye making. So for example, <clears throat> my cup. So there it is right there, this kind of appropriating mind that says, this is my cup. It's not your cup. It's not her cup. It's my cup. And the thing about it is, is that I can have that mentality that this is my cup and I can drink from it and I could use it. And there's all that. But the thing about it is, if somebody came and took my cup, I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get mental anguish from them taking my cup. So you know what? 
I relinquish the cup. I renounce the cup. Come and get it. I don't, I don't own it anymore. It's not mine. Cheers, right? <laughs> so I use the cup and I could use it as my cup or I could use it when it's just a cup. And the point is, is that that idea of my cup, <laughs> it's just, a, it's like a, it, it, a truly a delusion, meaning that it's a disposition that I have towards it. It's a, I have the disposition that it's my cup. But you know what's funny? If somebody comes along and steals my cup, you know what they're showing me? It wasn't my cup. They're proving to me. It's not your cup. <laughs> I just took it from you. Now, here's the Dharma that I would like to kind of look at. So the one way of looking at it is I've got my cup. It's my precious cup. And somebody took my cup, right? And I'm like, ah, where'd my cup go? I'm so upset that somebody took my cup. Now, one way of thinking about that situation is that if somebody, so somebody comes over and I'm like, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah, ha, and, ha, and they go, whoa, Michael, why are you so upset? If I were to say, because, because that person took my cup, that wouldn't actually be true. That wouldn't be honest. If that person said, Michael, why are you so upset? And I said, because I was attached to that cup. That's why I'm upset, because I was attached to it. That would be an honest answer. That would be a true dharmic answer about why I'm upset. Why am I upset? Because I was clinging to it. Because the reality is, is that again, if I relinquish it, and I'm like, you know what? I don't own this cup. Ownership is an illusion. I don't own it. Nobody owns anything. If I had that mental disposition towards it and somebody came and took it, I wouldn't be upset because I wasn't attached to it. So the idea here is, is we want to be looking at the arrows of sorrow, as our Bodhisattva tells us. We want to look at what could pull out the arrows of sorrow. In my scenario that I just laid out with the cup, if I'm sitting here very upset, ah, and somebody says, whoa, why are you upset? And I said, oh, because that person took my cup. That mentality that's like, ah, I'm so upset because I don't have my cup. That mentality if it got the cup back, it'd be happy again. Ah, I got my cup. Then they take the cup away again. Ah, where'd my cup go? And then I got the cup back. So the point is, is that I could sort of be joyful again if I get my cup back. But that's if the mentality thinks that one is upset because they lost their cup. The trick is, is that if you realize what's really causing the mental anguish and the suffering, which is that attachment to the cup, and you realize that and you're like, oh, well, then if I weren't attached to that cup, I could be not in anguish right now. And that state of not being in anguish right now from being independent of that object, nobody can mess with me. Nobody can take that away from me. Whereas in the other version, I'm dependent on the cup. If I get it back, I'm happy. If I lose it, I'm not. And I'm kind of going to be trapped in that kind of ebb and flow. Now, I got a little off track there in my example because I wanted to answer Renata. The point is, is that the, that all creatures to one degree or another, all creatures perform this kind of appropriation. 
and and they kind of have to and i'll i'll explain why that is but the basic idea is is that if i didn't appropriate in a sense that if i didn't like identify with this body the way that i do and the point is is that if i didn't and i put my hand on a hot stove classic example put my hand on a hot stove if i were like oh what's that smell <laughs> what what whoa the hands on fire if I didn't have that kind of association, appropriation, if you will, with the body in that sense, I, it, what I'm getting around to, Renata, is yes, the appropriating mind seems to have served a purpose in the evolutionary process. But the program that that biological evolutionary program is sort of it's still going and it's running kind of on autopilot. And what happened seemingly, what the Buddha seems to have realized is that that appropriating mind just keeps appropriating and appropriating and appropriating and appropriating and kind of can't stop appropriating in that way. And so that if we understand kind of the Dharma talk I've been giving up to this point, we understand that that evolutionary program of appropriation is a little out of control and causing us <laughs> mental anguish, mainly because we think that appropriating will lead to joy and happiness in, that, in the ways that I've been describing, like with my cup and things like that. Okay, everybody doing okay with where we're at? Still more to talk about with the arrows of anguish and all that. But any more questions before I keep <laughs> moving on? Okay, so uh, once again, if we go back to my original example of the person in my refrigerator in my dream, and I'd set up those different layers. One, the mental anguish from somebody being in my refrigerator but then at an even deeper level, there was the fabricating of the very Michael who had a barn kitchen, that Michael who, who got a bat and who had a problem with this person. The thing about it is, is that when that was happening, it seemed very real like as real, of course, as this feels in that way. And the idea, of course, now is the next, this is the next level that I wanted to add. So there was the interesting moment in the dream where I went and got the bat. And what I want to mention about that moment is it has to do with what the Buddhists would call samskara, conditioning, right? The kind of habits and the patterns and the cycles and the repetitions, all of that. And so there I was in this barn kitchen in, with the refrigerator, and none of that was true, right? It was a dream, all of, wasn't really my kitchen, all of that, right? But I thought it was. What we want to notice, or again, what I want to notice, what I'm trying to remember and pay attention to, is how my decision to go get a bat to intimidate this person, that karmic action, that samskara, reinforced my belief that it was my kitchen, my refrigerator with this problem, this person in there. Like I was performing an action based upon the presumption that there was this problem. And so that presumption reinforced the reality of this refrigerator problem. So my point is, is that in a diluted state, I performed actions that perpetuated that diluted state. And then that just perpetuated me through all the way through the dream in that sense. Okay, 
if everybody's with me on this example, yeah, no. Um, I have a question about the use of, you've been using the word I to refer to uh, sort of, I think alternately you, Michael, this Michael who is talking tonight, who had a dream yeah. and the Michael in the dream. And I, I don't know if it matters, but there are a couple of times when I was like, wait, which Michael? Because it, like in the dream, when you're dreaming, you're sort of identified with the Michael in the dream, right? Mm -hmm. Although at the same time, you're kind of watching the whole thing. The, the Michael, this Michael here is watching the whole thing from outside. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure it matters or, or something, but it was just, it kept like coming up for me that I was like, wait, which I? Yep. I think it's, I think it's, I, it's wonderful that the, the I, has become so complicated. It's sort of like mission accomplished then, like, cause it's really what I wanted to do. You know, your, your, your inquiry though leads me exactly to where I wanted to go. So my dream analogy or my dream that I've been telling you about, it has, it has ceased being useful because of this problem of the dreamer, the dream, the me telling you the story. So. With, with that dream understood in that way, let's bring it into a non-analogous analogous situation. So another scenario, not a scenario, no, this has not happened to me exactly, but I have had enough experiences in my life to, to kind of, uh, you know, that this is coming from a place of experience but I'm exaggerating to make an interesting story. I'm at, you can imagine somebody having some kind of anxiety attack. And the particular kind of anxiety attack that I wanna talk about is a kind of paranoia and it's a paranoia, maybe it's, you know, you could imagine perhaps drug induced, it could be just pure anxiety produced, but a kind of paranoid anxiety attack where someone feels that they're coming to, to get them, <laughs> that they, right, the, the you know, ambiguous they <laughs> are coming to get me. Now, imagine somebody who's in that kind of a mode, who's in that kind of a panic attack that's beginning to now look around very nervously. And all of a sudden, they look out their window and they see their next door neighbors on the telephone. And they know that the neighbors are calling, like they're calling the cops on me. They're in on it, right? And then I hear a helicopter and it's like, oh, oh my God, they, my next door neighbor called the cops on me. They are coming to get me. I better hide. And so, you know, I, whatever I go and I hide or whatever, right? So this whole big scenario. Later on that day or the next morning, I wake up, the, the anxiety has passed and I realize, oh, the, the neighbors were not calling the cops on me. That, that helicopter didn't have anything to do with me. But when I was in that state of panic, I made the helicopter about me. I made the neighbor calling somebody. I made that about me. And because I was doing that, I was suffering from this anxiety that they were going to come and get me. And just like in the dream that I was describing, when someone is in such a state, they believe it's happening. And what I'm getting at is, is that in the scenario that I was describing, that self is a self that feels like they're a wanted person. But are they a wanted person? 
They're not, but they feel like they are. And that's like me in the dream thinking that that was my kitchen when it really wasn't my kitchen, but in the dream, I thought it was. Well, in a kind of anxiety panic attack, you could imagine things that aren't true, but in the moment you're thinking them, they feel true. And then just like in my dream that I was describing, you perform a action, you perform karma, like going and hiding. And that reinforces the belief that you're a wanted person and that the helicopter's coming to get you. So you see how it's the same process of being in a deluded state, being confused, and then not knowing that and performing karmic actions that then perpetuate it. In both situations, in my dream that I mentioned and in an anxiety or panic attack, it would, it would behoove both people to stop for a moment and reflect upon what's going on rather than just carrying away and, and acting in that way. The Buddhist, the Buddhist recommendation of stopping and seeing, of slowing down and observing, not acting, what we call mindfulness, what we call sati or shmurti, but that process, the idea is, is that had I had the wherewithal in my dream to stop for a minute and really reflect on what was going on, I probably would have remembered, oh yeah, I don't have a barn kitchen. This is a dream. And, I, and because I'm a lucid dreamer, I probably would have become lucid at that point had I had the wherewithal to stop and be like, wait a minute, this isn't my kitchen. How, da, there's a, how could a person be in a refrigerator like that, right? But I didn't. And so the dream continued. If one is having an anxiety or panic attack, it behooves them to calm down. It behooves them to any, anybody will say, calm down and breathe. <laughs> That's like the number one recommendation for situations like that, or at least the, the initial starting point is calm down and breathe. And in that state of calm breathing, we might remember that they're not after us, that we're actually not that interesting, <laughs> that, the, that the world doesn't actually care that much about us in that way. So Everybody following me on step one, the dream, step two, the anxiety attack. Then, of course, we bring it to reality, reality, reality. You know, this. Well, the basic idea of Buddhist philosophy in this way is that Th that everything that we're experiencing at any given moment is kind of like a panic attack <laughs> as far as dukkha is concerned. And what I mean is, is that there is a fabricating of a sense of self going on that's causing anguish, anxiety, dukkha, and we are doing karmic activity that is actually perpetuating that delusion rather than stopping and noticing. And the reason why I have gone off on this for so long, what I really wanted to point at was that me in the dream who actually believed that that was their kitchen and the person in the anxiety attack who actually believes that they are a wanted person I wanted to point at how that is a sense of self, but it, I, I want to point at how we can have a sense of self, but there actually not be that. That how that could actually really, really happen. So that when the Buddha, when Buddha Dharma tells us that that's still happening right here, <laughs> that same process is happening right here, but the stubborn, persistent idea of like, no, 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 no. This is really me. 
I understand that that was delusional and not really my kitchen. I understand that that was delusional and that the helicopter wasn't really coming to get me. But this is real though. This, I, you know, I'm, I'm in my house now, not a dream house. I'm in my house. And what we want to begin to notice is, and this is where I'm going all the way back to the beginning, it's the me and my making where the very idea that this is my laptop, my laptop, my house, the my, the, the making it mine is creating that sense of Michael who has a laptop in a house and all of that. And that's a kind of dependently originated feedback loop of self-generation based upon appropriating consciousness in that way. So what we wanna be interested in then is a clear mind that's not doing that. And now we get to our Bodhisattva's answer here. So our Bodhisattva tells us that the answer to all of this is to see the sameness, the samatha, the equanimity of I and mine. And once again, the reason why I took you on this long journey through my crazy dream is because I also wanted to be able to come back and point out at how in that dream scenario that I've been talking about where there was me, my kitchen and my refrigerator, that me, which had a barn kitchen, that me was just as empty, illusory as the kitchen that wasn't really mine. So my point is, is that if you can see in my scenario, in my dream scenario, if you can see how the Michael idea and the Michael's kitchen idea are both these dream delusions and therefore they are equally dream delusions. It wasn't that there was a Michael who was real and the kitchen that was fake. That Michael who had a barn kitchen, who does, there isn't that Michael, but that one in the dream was just as not real as the barn kitchen itself, meaning my kitchen. So what I'm pointing at is the equanimity in that scenario, the equanimity of I and mine. And the Bodhisattva is telling us that if you can see the sameness of all the I and minds, that's the single characteristic Dharma door. That idea of the sameness of I and mine. In an, in right now, me, Michael, in an unenlightened mode, I am thinking that there's me and my cup, and that those are two different things, the owner and the owned, subject, object. But if you can see the equanimity or the sameness of subject and object, that's the single characteristic Dharma door. Okay. Questions, comments about that first one, which was really just getting, getting us warmed up. Okay. So that brings us to the theme for tonight. Can I ask, oh. I think it's a quick question. I wasn't sure if that was a question. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, is, is, one, is one flavor or one taste the same as one characteristic? I, hmm. I'm confused because I can't remember if you used that phrase in the last, it's come up in the last few weeks, but it might've been in another class I took. Yes. Like, it the is. The idea of the single flavor, is the idea of the single characteristic. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're, we're about to go deeper into all of those ideas too, or the idea of the single characteristic. 
So that brings me to the theme for tonight, the, the theme proper, like what I really wanted to talk about. So, and we've been talking about it, by the way, I've just sort of been holding off on telling you specifically. So these two ideas, samskrita and asamskrita, what would be translated as either the conditioned and the unconditioned, but you also might see it as compounded and uncompounded. That's sort of, um, I don't like to use the word compounded, uncompounded. I prefer conditioned and unconditioned, but you might see both. So these are the ideas that I wanna talk about. It has to do with our next bodhisattva. But before we do that, so the next bodhisattva is called unconditional bodhisattva <laughs> or, you know, or the unconditioned bodhisattva. So asamskrita bodhisattva in that way. So before we talk specifically about this bodhisattva, I want to kind of quickly just mention a few words, a few ideas about the conditioned and the unconditioned. This is even deeper than we've been talking. So I wanted to kind of prepare us in that way. So I know many of you have already heard a lot about these ideas, um, but you know, again, if you're new, new to these ideas, Buddhism talks quite a bit about the conditioned and the unconditioned. Last week, I did a Dharma talk on rajas, the dust, the dust of the world, the dust of phenomenal objects, the dust of sensory objects. And, you know, I did a whole Dharma talk on, on that idea of the dust. And ultimately, once we got around to really get talking about it, the idea was is that all of this sensory data, all of these sensory inputs, all of it is like dust accumulating on our sensory organs, clouding our vision. I didn't mention it last week, but basically the dust is the conditioned. The dust is the compounded. So tonight I wanted to talk about the uncompounded. I want to talk about the unconditioned, that which is not the dust. And in order to kind of just point to try to point at the unconditioned, I wanted to walk you through a little mental exercise. It's just a, a quick little mental exercise so that we know what we're talking about when we say unconditioned, right? So let me grab a little prop. Let's see. Well, I always like to start with this one. So this, this is a little treasure box, a little treasure chest. So to start us off, I wanna ask you, do, do you want what's in this box? And in this example, what I wanna point at is how you haven't seen what's in the box, right? And by the way, I'm not making any references to any movies or anything like that. Everybody get, don't get excited. Just saying what's in the box, right? So you haven't seen it. You haven't heard it. You haven't smelled it. You haven't tasted it. You haven't touched it. However, I did give you something to go on. I gave something for your mind. And remember in Buddhism, the brain or the mind is a sixth sensory organ. It's just a very fancy eyeball that sees mm, not light, but it sees ideas. Ideas are the mental, are, ideas are the objects of the mind. 
And as I often mention in my classes, you should probably think about when you're thinking about something, it's more as if that idea is stuck to your mind and that's why you're thinking about it. And all the things that you're not thinking about right now, it's because they're not in contact with your mind. So when I tell you, do you want what's in there? You have something to go on. Like you, you're sitting there going, well, I know it's little. And usually, you know, little things are not very desirable, right? Because they're so little, unless maybe it's a very valuable little, little thing. But the point is, is that you haven't, again, you haven't seen it, smelt it, tasted, touched it, anything like that. But you have those few little things to go on. So this isn't a very good example of the unconditioned. I got to come up with something better. So now what I want to tell you is, is that I have something over there. Do you want it? But you still have something to go on, right? It's, it's like, it's locatable. Like if I told you, if I told you, you know, that I was talking about love, it couldn't be over there, right? Because love's kind of everywhere or nowhere, but I, it, it wouldn't make for me to say any sense that I have something over there. So even that, even that little bit of information is something to go on for your mind to think about. The point is, is that all of those ideas, for example, when I was talking about the thing in here, what it was, was conditional. It was dependent because it had to fit in this little box. So what it was had these conditions to it in that sense. And even when I point it over there, it's still now conditional because it's directional, locatable in that way. So my point is, is that conditions is like we would, like I've been using it that it's conditional in that sense. So what I've actually been trying to do is to then get you to wonder, well, then how would you conceive of the unconditioned? How, how could that possibly go down, right? Because basically, if you're thinking of something, then it's that thing. And the unconditional has, is unconditional. There's no conditions in that sense. So what I've tried to do just now is to make kind of more clear what is conditional versus what is unconditional. And what we want to understand right now is that everything everything is conditional and it's conditional in a variety of ways one is for example you take like my little cup i always like to use my little cup and there's one way in which this little cup right now is conditional and it's conditional in terms of like, it's dependent upon some glue because it actually broke not too long ago and I had to glue it. And so right now there's glue that's holding it together. And if it weren't for that glue, I wouldn't have a cup. So it's conditional based upon its molecular atomic structure in that sense. But in the Dharma doors on Sunday nights, we talk about how things are conditional at an even deeper level. And that's where I've talked about the cup being big or small. 
which is it? Is it big or small? And anybody that's coming to Dolmen Doors knows it is neither big nor small because the smallness is conditional. It's relative. And if I had a tiny, tiny, tiny little cup, this would be big now. So the size of this depends. It depends. It depends. It's conditional. I've talked about how the color is conditional. I've talked about how the shape is conditional. I've talked about how the very label cup. Cup is conditional. It's based upon that it has one of these. If this didn't have that and it were flat, it would be a saucer. It wouldn't be a cup. So this cup as a cup is entirely conditional, entirely dependent upon conditions to be this cup. And that goes for everything. And then there's the unconditioned. For the Dharma heads out there, I want to tell you that originally, traditionally, in old school kind of Hinayana Buddhism, there was one, maybe two things that were unconditioned nirvana and space. Those two things in most schools of early Buddhism, those were considered unconditional. Everything else is conditional. It's temporary, it's dependent, it's relative, it's compounded, it's, it's conditional. Nirvana, the state of the cessation of suffering, Nirvana was understood to be the unconditioned. Not just, not just something unconditioned, but actually the unconditioned. And you would even find in sutras where the Buddha says, yeah, and for lack of a better term, we call it nirvana because it's unconditioned. Eventually, the dimension of space works its way into the philosophy as being an unconditioned phenomena. We don't need to go into that much tonight because it's not really what this is all about. So that's just to explain conditioned, unconditioned. Let's hear what the Bodhisattva has to tell us about the single characteristic Dharma door. So the unconditional Bodhisattva tells us, uh, and I'll read from the Tibetan one, I suppose. Um, the Bodhisattva tells us that the Dharma teaching on the single characteristic expresses the non-apprehension or uncompounded or unconditionedness of the realm of desire, the realm of form, the formless realm, the Dharma of Shravakas, the Dharma of solitary Buddhas. Once again, it's a little chunky. It's a little like not super clear. From the Chinese, the unconditional bodhisattva says that if there's no clinging to, or actually the verb is an interesting verb, it's to climb, to climb on, but there's a particular connotation that there's a clingingness to the verb climb. So, but I want you to be fully aware of the poetics going on involved. Unconditional Bodhisattva says, if there is no climbing the conditions of the realm of desire, the realm of form, the formless realm, the Dharma of Shravakas, the Dharma of solitary Buddhas, even all Buddha Dharma. This is called the single characteristic Dharma door. 
So this is where the Bodhisattva and the kind of the Mahayana is going a little deeper than the early tradition. And what I mean by that is originally there was the dust of the world, the conditioned, boo, boo, like bad conditioned. And then there was the unconditioned, nirvana, peace and bliss. <sighs> Yay, nirvana. And so we wanted to get out of the dust of the world. We wanted to, to brush the dust of the world off our shoulders and get up to nirvana, the unconditioned. And that was the project to sort of tap into the unconditioned and be of, in, with the unconditioned, to be in nirvana. That was the idea. This bodhisattva has just explained something a little bit different, which is that it's about not having anything to do with the realm of desire, the realm of form, the formless realm, dharma of shravakas, dharma of protecu buddhas, and in the Chinese, even Buddha dharma. So to not be involved in any of that is the single characteristic dharma door. Now, the point is, is that you could almost map it, you could really almost map it like this. So in the oldest, most original form of Buddhism, in fact, I would go so far as to say, according to the meditative traditions that the Buddha learned before he was enlightened, so the, the standard traditions of meditation and yoga at the time of the Buddha, but before the Buddha became enlightened, that form of meditation and yoga was really focused on what's called the realm of desire, the realm of form, and then the exalted formless realm. The entry point, the entryway to the formless realm is space, pure infinite akasha. And you might recall that I mentioned that space is considered by most Buddhist schools to be an unconditioned dharma, an unconditioned phenomena. What that means is, is that in the pre-Buddhist early form of yoga meditation, you were trying to get out of the realm of desire by moving into a realm of neutral elemental reality, just the realm of the four elements, just the realm of sh shape, size, number, solid, liquid, gas, temperature, right? But then from there, you could then access the unconditioned. Awesome. Until the Buddha comes along. And he says, no, going to the realm, the formless realm, via the realm of infinite space, that, that just gives the, the mind a break. That's just a good meditation. So the Buddha taught the shravakas, taught the, the voice hearers, how to get into nirvana. So that's the fourth on our list. So the Bodhisattva tells us to not get involved in the conditions of the realm of desire, the realm of form, the formless realm, or Shravaka Dharma. And they're basically talking about Nirvana, like old school, original Nirvana. But then even that, of course, is relative. Like I was pointing out, where the dust of the world is considered bad and the nirvana is considered good. So the dharma of a pratekya bhuta is basically the dharma, the teaching of emptiness, 
the Dharma, the teaching of absolute equality via emptiness. And therefore, conditioned, unconditioned, every, those are just words. Those are just ideas. So that's like Pratekya Buddha Dharma, which is pretty good. And in fact, that's where the Tibetan version stops. But it's interesting that the, boot, the Chinese version goes one step further and adds even not getting involved in Buddha Dharma, in the conditions of Buddha Dharma. And that's always a really interesting one because it's sort of like, this is Buddha Dharma. And it's telling you not to even get involved in the conditions of this which is the teaching of not getting involved in the conditions of things. So that's the single characteristic Dharma door. When there is no getting involved in the relative conditional formations of any of that desire realm, realm of form, formless realm, and so on. Now, one of the quick ways you can think about this is to understand huh, the formless realm. Isn't that dependent upon there being this realm of form? Like, you don't get to have the very, you don't even get to have the idea of the formless realm if there's not a realm of form. So the formless realm is conditional. It, it by its very nature, by definition, it is conditional because it is de it's dependent upon and based on there being a realm of form. And that, of course, is conditional and relative to the realm of desire and so on and so forth. So to really transcend all of that conditionality, that's the single characteristic Dharma door. Questions, comments, answers about that one. Cool. So because it, I, I'm, I was hoping that we would get to this, we only have a little bit of time, but the next Bodhisattva, we can, we can do it in the time allotted. So this Bodhisattva is called, our next Bodhisattva is called Avalokanam. Avalokanam. And Avalokanam means... Well, sort of uh, avalokana, like seeing everywhere, all sight. It's like, yeah, 360 all around sight, bodhisattva. And the bodhisattva's name, which involves seeing, is going to be important. So, the Bodhisattva, yeah, I'm going to read just my uh, translation from the Chinese because the Tibetan is, is very, very chunky. So Avalokanam Bodhisattva says, if when explaining the Dharma, the Dharma of equanimity is explained as the equanimity of the Dharma of emptiness, without the perception of emptiness and without the perception of equanimity. This is called explaining the single characteristic Dharma door. So this is where, and by the way, the Tibetan, I believe the Tibetan does mention this. Yeah, the Tibetan sort of starts to allude to it. So the Chinese, as I mentioned last week, it's a little more interested in someone explaining these teachings to others and then doing it in a way. So for example, in this one, it's about what's the, what is the single characteristic Dharma or teaching? Well, it's explaining the Dharma 
and it's when explaining the Dharma, it's explaining the Dharma of equanimity as the equanimity of the Dharma of emptiness without the samya, without the perception of emptiness or equanimity. So the bodhisattva uh, free of sorrow, free of the darkness of sorrow, that bodhisattva is the one that introduced us to this idea of samatha, equanimity between uh, I and mine, right? And when I was explaining that, when, when I was explaining that earlier, I pointed at the equanimity of self and possession. I pointed at their equanimity through their empty nature. I used my dream analogy, but what I was pointing at is how the very I the very kind of diluted sense of self that might be wanted by helicopters or might have barn kitchens, like that delusion of a self is empty, not real, totally empty. And my kitchen barn or my whatever is also empty. And insofar as I and, uh, and possession are both empty, they are equal, they are the same, they are equally empty in that way. So I, in that example, tried to explain the teaching by pointing at equanimity through the Dharma teaching of emptiness. So that's the way I tried to do it because I knew that this Bodhisattva was coming who was gonna tell us that that would be the way to do it, except I was supposed to have done that without the perception of emptiness or equality. And that's, that's where it, it, this, it just goes like, whoa, what? Like, what does that mean? Now, what we wanna notice is, and let me just, I'll just work with the emptiness one right now. I say this a lot, Nagarjuna says this a lot, Lots of Dharma teachers say this a lot. Don't turn emptiness into something. Don't turn it into a substratum of reality. Don't turn it into void. Definitely don't turn emptiness into just this part because emptiness is, is just as much about this part as it is about this part. So there's these constant warnings that if you turn emptiness into something, you are not talking about emptiness. Because emptiness is about the very lacking of svabhava, which is to say the very lacking of being something. That's emptiness, the lacking of being something. So if you turn that into something, you're gonna to have to empty out emptiness. And many Dharma teachers have said exactly what I just said, which is that if you turn emptiness into something, then you're just gonna to have to empty that too in that way. That would be along the lines of not having the perception of emptiness. So not, you know, reifying it in that sense. And then what's also interesting about this is that we're explaining this also without the perception of equanimity. And that's where it's like, but well, wait a minute. I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing was, was perceiving all things as equal, like abiding in equanimity. So it's basically telling me, telling me to abide in equanimity without the perception of equanimity. And of course the idea is, is like, oh, that, that would be really equanimous in that sense. Whereas 
to bring in the idea of equanimity creates the idea of non-equanimity. And now we're off balance again, and we're in the realm of the condition to dust. So all of these different bodhisattvas have been pointing us uh, the way out of the dust. All right. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas? I know that was a lot of different ideas. I'm just looking through the chat, seeing if anybody got anything, anything? Well, I mean, one thing that I'll add just at the end to sort of kind of recap a little bit and to try to once again, kind of point at the idea of conditioned, unconditioned, because that's the talk tonight. So one of the things to think about, it's an idea that I've been mentioning many times, but we want to kind of think about, like with my big cup, little cup, that idea, right? What we kind of want to be thinking about regarding conditionality, this idea of samskrita. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but samskrita, that word. So sam, as we know, in Dharma doors, we use words that have the prefix sam a lot. And sam always has this connotation of bringing together and like kind of basically making the same. So like my little cup, the fact that there's this part and there's this part, but your mind brings them that they're, they're the cup, you know, it's just one, it's not a handle and this it's the cup. Well, that's some, that's some, and you could then do, a, there's a variety of different words that then are some, like samadhi, samnya, samskara, samsara, all the words that are about this kind of coagulating, coming together. So that's some, samskrita. Skritta is an interesting word, and the root of that word is krita, kritya, which does mean to sort of make or craft, fabricate. Samskritta means to kind of make or fabricate together into one. Think clay, think fabricating into an object, samskritta. But what we've been talking about tonight is not and even though I mentioned it a little bit, we're not actually talking about the, the ceramics that were samskritted, that were moved, made into a cup. Conditioning we've been talking about is about the little cup and how the littleness is, is part of your conditioning to label it that way. So in other words, samskara, samskrita, these ideas are all related in this kind of fabricating kind of a way. And the idea is, is that if you're looking at it carefully now, as far as, oh, you begin to kind of see how everything is conditioned in its own way, but that's what's making it what it is, is this kind of process of samskrita, this process of conditioning. And if you understand that that's the process that's going on for all objective objectification in that way, you can then sort of begin to see the equanimity of all phenomena because it's all conditioned. And in its conditionality, things are not more conditioned or better conditioned or whatever. It's everything is conditioned in that way. So my point is, is that thinking about conditionality 
is a really good way to get to equanimity and a really good way to get all dharmas on an evil, even playing field that way. Renata, I'm sorry, please. I guess to a certain point, I'm wondering what is the point of reading and writing sutras if by the very uh, uh, you know, act of using language and describing and reading it, we are labeling it and we'll never understand it from what I understand. Mm. Uh, it, it seems like language is a big part of the problem. Um, indeed, there is a long discourse in, in Buddhism about that, both in terms of recognizing what you just recognized, Renata, regarding that language, reading, writing, communication, speech, all of that is all conditionality. It's all more conditions. And so there is sort of one kind of Buddhist path in a way, an early Buddhist path that would respond to that with what they call the noble silence. What is the best rightest answer? <laughs> the noble silence, that's, you know. But then, you know, Renata, Buddhism sort of matures out of that. And what I, when I say matures out of that, it, it recognizes that, for example, silence is conditional and it's relative to speech. So even by being silent, we haven't escaped the conditional in that regard. And that's where you eventually get around, Renata, to the very, very kind of, it's by now it's one of the most, but a very famous Zen Buddhist saying, which is about not mistaking the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. Language, reading, writing, sutras, and all of that are fingers that are pointing at something. And what they often talk about is how it is a dog that'll look at the finger. But a wise person looks at where the finger is pointing and doesn't get confused. Likewise, we want to see where these sutras are pointing. But if we're just staring at the words in that way and looking at the finger, we're, we'll miss where it's pointing. So. With, with that note of the finger pointing at the moon, I'm going to, yay. <laughs> That's a great, <laughs> oh, thank you so much, everybody. Um, yep, that's going to be it for me until we continue the single characteristic Dharma door next week.